Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I'll get things started because I know we're just after five. Um, welcome to our Overcoming the Hurdles to Build a Successful Travel Startup with Duffel. I'm Krista. I lead the marketing team here at Duffel. And again, thank you for joining and taking the time out. Also, a special welcome for those from the Travel Massive community. Uh, we're glad that, to have you here. Just a few housekeeping items before we kick things off. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end, but feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar. Uh, you'll see that there's a Q&A spot at the bottom in terms of the panel, uh, so feel free to just submit them and we can cover them off when we can. Uh, we'll also be recording this webinar and so it will be available for you afterwards. We'll be sending it out to the link, uh, sending the link out to the email addresses that you use to register for the webinar. Uh, we also have live transcript enabled, so if that's of interest to you, if you go to more, you'll be able to follow along there if you'd just like some special assistance. Otherwise, uh, excited to get started and, and kick things off. Um, first, we'll be oops, sorry, going through the agenda for today. Um, so welcome and introductions. We'll say why now is the right time to start your business. Uh, what regulations and requirements exist? how to manage payments and make money. We have the end for the Q&A, uh, and then we'll end things likely a little bit early just so that you can go on the rest of your day. We have our exciting panelists with us today. And so to kick things off, uh, we have Steve Doman, who is the CEO and co-founder of Duffel. If you're not familiar with Duffel, uh, it's a flights and payments API that basically makes it super easy for any merchant to get started selling flights, making bookings, adding paid extras like seats and bags. Uh, it's a developer-friendly platform, uh, and you'll hear more about what Duffel does during the webinar today. Uh, but for Steve, uh, Steve set out on a mission to rebuild travel tech in 2017. Uh, he was an early employee at GoCardless, where he led the platform engineering team. Uh, he dropped out of college and was part of a bunch of startups. And so we're excited to have him join us today. Steve, any words? Everyone's very excited to be here. Great, thanks. Uh, and next we have Tim Rogers. Tim is the head of product here at Duffel. Uh, Tim has over 10 years of experience uh, spanning software engineering, business development, and customer support. He was also an early employee at GoCardless. Um, but here at Duffel, he heads up the product vision and strategy. So things like our self-serve product that we launched last year and components, which uh, we'll speak to a little bit more. But before Duffel, Tim, uh, Tim was an early, so ran his own startup. Uh, Flight Finder, which was acquired in 2020. Hi, Tim. Any words from you? Hey, all. Thanks, Krista. Excited to have you all here um, and to see people that you know are excited about the future of travel in the way that we are. Great, thanks. And last but not least, we have Sam Argyle, who is the Managing Director of Alternative Airlines. Uh, which is a global flight search and booking site. Having previously worked at an investment bank in Rothschild, at, with Rothschild, Sam joined Alternative Airlines in 2015 and became managing director in 2017. During this time, Alternative Airlines was awarded a place on the 2019 Sunday Times Tech track list, showing the fastest growing tech companies and growing from six to 60 employees. By focusing exclusively on flights, Alternative Air they offer a complete, convenient, and personalized booking experience, regardless of location, demographic, or reason for booking. Alternative Airlines recently announced a 196% increase in sales in 2021 to 28 million. Welcome, Sam. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here and part of this conversation. Great, thank you. So to kick things off, we're starting off with why is the right time to start a travel business? Crunchbase points out that fintech pioneers Stripe and Square were both founded during a time of crisis in their industry. And so while we know venture capital investment in travel startups fell in 2020, it was projected to bounce back to 44 billion by the end of 2021. And we've seen some investments in purchases such as Hopper raising 175 million, Travel Perk at 150 million, Fly Now Pay Later 75 million, just to name a few. And so that's showing that there's appetite and opportunity coming back to the industry. Plus, we know there's also potential growth and demand for travel with 47% projected for 2022. Steve, can you share a little bit of, of your take on it? Yeah, of course. Um, first, uh, I'll, I'll apologize. I, um, I caught COVID over the weekend, so I might be coughing a little bit, uh, but nothing, nothing serious. 
Um, yeah, I think, I mean, broadly speaking, now is now is an excellent time to be uh, to be starting in travel. Um, as, as you mentioned, Krista, there's going to be a, a big rebound in consumer demand. Uh, things have dropped off massively and then they're going to grow back to where they were uh, and more. Uh, it's going to take a little while, but I think there's reason to be to be um, very optimistic. Um, and I'd say like in these times where there is a, a massive growth, um, that's it's always um, a, a good time to, to be in business, always a good time to, to start a business. The second point is that there is a gener generational shift in how uh, travel is booked. That has been happening uh, over like a, uh, um, you know, a long time. It's not something that's uh, just now, but um, there's still a massive proportion of trips that are booked offline. That's something that really surprised me when, when I first started in the industry. And inevitably, all of that is going to shift to online and, and then mobile over time. And the, the numbers, if you look at the penetration rate there, are still like fairly small uh, compared to other industries. So it's going to be a big opportunity there. And then finally, I think the, the, there is a, a change on, on, in expectations from the consumers um, in terms of the kind of experience that they want. And that's going to lead to the rise of new players. And uh, hopefully some of the, the people in the audience are these new players. Great, thanks for sharing your view. And Sam, what do you think about it? What are your expectations for 2022? Yeah, Chris, I think I think you made kind of a great point at the beginning. You know, history always tells us that crises provide entrepreneurs with the opportunity to kind of think differently about their business models and really their customer proposition. So I actually think rather counterintuitively, it is a good time to start a travel business at the moment. Um, in my opinion, the kind of the, the big difference now in 2022 versus many times over the last decades is really the access to technology that travel sellers now have. And this is a point that Steve just kind of alluded to here. Um, I think there's so many brilliant B2B travel companies out there at the moment in the industry. Um, they really kind of specialize in solving uh, pain points for companies or pain points for customers. Uh, we work with loads of them in our business alternative airlines. Uh, we like to think that technology should be used to improve the customer experience um, and improve internal process and efficiencies. So I think, I think it's a great time to start a travel business. Uh, the access to technology is greater than ever before. Um, in terms of expectations, 2022, the last two years have taught me it's a really dangerous game to predict absolutely anything. Um, but I guess if I was to make a couple of predictions, um, I think travel sellers in 2022 need to continue to differentiate themselves, probably more than ever so. Uh, I think fintech will continue to be a really important part of the travel industry, um, both for sellers, um, both kind of facing customers, but also within their businesses as well. Um, and then looking wider at the industry, I'd probably say the leisure sector will continue to recover fastest. Um, we've seen in our business the, the really interesting concept of revenge travel, um, the idea that customers haven't traveled in a couple of years, they're likely to treat themselves to upgrades or additional perks. Um, and we've seen attachment rates for seats over the last six months over 30%, and we've seen a huge increase in the percentage of premium and business class flights being booked. So yeah, so just a couple of kind of things we're seeing from our business and some trends that we're also um, identifying. Great, no, thanks for sharing, very interesting. And as we know that it, it could still be a right time even though it's counterintuitive a little bit, we know that there's still a lot of hurdles to begin to sell flights, especially when we start to look at requirements and regulations. Travel in general is, is complex, but if we look at flights, there are generally four main areas to consider accreditation such as IATA and ARC, local licensing that you need for the different regions in which you want to operate, ticketing authority if you're working directly with airlines, and ongoing management. Steve, can you walk us through some of the requirements, like what you've worked through to get Duffel started or how you figured it all out? How oh, I'm still figuring it all out, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, Somewhat fortunately, we had absolutely no idea about all of that stuff when we started Duffel, which I think was uh, very much a blessing in disguise uh, because I had known all of the complexity. Uh, maybe uh, we would have taken a different path. Um, 
we're very naive and 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 i think it kind of touches on some of the the points um sam was making that uh technology was gonna like be the only thing we needed to worry about and sure enough we wanted to come and make a difference on the technology there's lots of stuff already available but we thought we had something to to do there and we focused on that piece initially but then one thing after another we started discovering more problems and um we connected to airlines and then the airlines we were connected to started asking about iata numbers and bsp and we're like what's what's happening you know like what's the what, what are they asking <laughs> um and we were like all clueless at the time i mean the five or six of us that were there uh, back then uh, were completely uh, clueless we've been quite fortunate that um, I'm very lucky early on in the, the path of the company, uh, I um, run into a formidable industry veteran, uh, Javier Gallego, who's helped us a ton uh, figuring out that stuff. He was uh, the global managing director at IATA for uh, all things distribution and settlement. And so we, I mean, he's helped us shape the strategy and figuring out where we should get the IATAs, how we should get them, uh, figure out the local licenses requirement, local licenses um, requirements. Um, and then as we grew volume, we started learning more about ops. But it's very much been a continuous learning process. It's taken us time. Um, lots of readings. Uh, we've got some of the, the massive IATA books uh, in the office uh, with all of the acronyms and all of the things you, you need to know. And to to a large extent, it has informed what we're building with Duffel. Um, I think Tim is going to cover that uh, shortly, but we've put all of that knowledge and all of that effort that we've put into getting these licenses and accreditation and turn them into a simple product that you can sign up online. And so it's been uh, it's been quite painful in summary and, uh, and and took a long time, but we've been very lucky that we got a lot of help along the way. No, great for sharing that insight. Sam, from your perspective, how did alternative airlines do it? And would you have any tips or recommendations on what you would do differently now? So much like Steve, we're still learning every day on this. So definitely don't pretend to be an expert in this area, but it's, um, as you can imagine, as a flight to OTA, kind of good relationships with airlines on IATA is just absolutely essential. Um, full disclosure, I was incredibly lucky in this area, uh, in many of these areas. Alternative Airlines is a family business. Um, it was created by my father back in 2007. So when I, I joined the business in 2015, many of these kind of important agreements by UK billing a settlement plan or was known as BSP were kind of already in place uh, alongside the main IATA agreements. Um, and that obviously helped us as we kind of set about changing the platform and the tech stack behind the business that we had a lot of these existing relationships. Therefore, kind of since sort of 2017, most of my role and, and the company's focus has been on kind of maintaining those relationships with those important partners, um, developing new relationships with new airlines or airlines that have entered uh, UK being, billing and settlement plan, and also kind of constantly evaluating the best sources of airline content. Um, one of the things we've done and, and will continue always to do is really looking for new airlines that are signifying that they're looking to work with the trade or travel sellers um, and we normally see that from you know entering UK BSP um, so we're always reaching out to new airlines to discuss their distribution model um, and understand how we can support them in what they're trying to achieve too. We work really closely with IATA um, to ensure that they have very up-to-date information on our financial health, um, our sales trends and reports are understood and communicated uh, we want to make sure that airline partners really understand our business model uh, and what is happening. Um, my experience in that area is that over communication is probably a good thing in this area. Um, um, one of the things that we've looked at, local licensing is really, really challenging. Um, we're, a, we're a global business in that we sell into many, many markets, um, but we're a simple business actually that we issue everything in the UK under one IATA agreement. So I guess um, our experience of local licensing will be in the future rather than now. Um, but I think the complexity in that area has meant that we've delayed it longer than we probably would have. Um, and probably echo what Steve just said around the challenges around local licensing. 
Um, and then probably just finally, we, we've kind of seen great success though from building, making the effort to build relationships with, with airlines and IATA. Um, it gives them real reassurance on who we are, how we operate um, and what's happening from our end. Um, from my perspective, you know, perseverance is key in this um, and probably a bit of an appreciation that in this industry, things take time, but they ultimately do happen. You know, there is, it is a, it is a slow burn, but I do think that things do change um, and it happen, but it, it definitely needs perseverance. One, uh, one quick question, if I can jump in. Uh, Sam, you were talking about the, the local license versus, versus um, uh, operating from the UK today. One of the questions we we often get from uh, the, the uh, travel sellers that uh, engage with us is um, how much they should get um, these local licenses versus like starting from the UK. How have you found it in your conversations with airlines that that's the, the fact that you're operating globally but out of the UK? Yeah, and I, and I think that it's a great question and one that one of the reasons why we have to really take time to build relationships with the airlines is to for them to understand our business model because our our business model as as many online businesses is slightly different in the sense that we can drive traffic from anywhere around the world to our dot-com site but then issue that ticket in the uk so it might be a domestic travel in tanzania it might be domestic travel in australia south america uh, it might be a, a long haul international one but what we have to all we have to do is working with our partners for them to really understand our business model and how we're driving because we don't need a local license to be able to attract a customer from australia to the website um, but if we wanted to be able to issue tickets there with IATA and for that airline we would need a local license so um, I think like most businesses, you're constantly assessing whether it's worth the effort and the investment and you're prioritizing where in your business to spend on that. But I do, it is, if you're looking at pain points in our business, um, being able to issue local tickets is a real pain point And one of the reasons why we haven't set up local licenses globally. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, and Tim, how about you? Can you share how you think this will maybe change moving forward? Yeah, sure. It's been really interesting, I think, to hear both Steve and Sam's experiences in this area. Um, the fact that kind of you hear Steve's story and how hard it is to get started, but then also Sam's story where I guess he had the, the good fortune of landing with a, a, a the, the foundations of a travel business already set up. But the, And the fact there that it kind of the hard work doesn't end once you've set it up for the first time, but actually it's an ongoing process to have a kind of the basics of a travel industry that can work and grow and succeed in the long term and sell in many different markets and, and all those kinds of things. So I think really interesting to see that kind of end to end challenge rather than something that's kind of over once you get past the hump of building a business from scratch. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with how how frustrating the experience of, of booking travel can be today. It might be for many of us a while since we've done that, given the, the last few years of pandemic, but I'm sure we can all look back and remember those kind of, those tough experiences. And it, it, it just really makes me think that travel does desperately need innovation. So we do need people like Sam and, and others using Duffel kind of coming in with, with great ideas to, to change travel for the better. And as, as Sam said himself, you know, I think there's no better the time than the start of 2022 to, to think about doing that. But from, from what you see through the stories we've just been hearing, you know, like the barriers of being, the barriers to being able to do that are, are often really quite high. You know, there's the accreditations, there's the local licenses, there's the airline relationships, but more than that, there are a bunch of other things we haven't even mentioned, you know, the amount of kind of airline industry knowledge and jargon you have to be able to deal with to even kind of do the basic job of selling flights is, is really quite an insurmountable obstacle. And it's not saying it's like, easy to understand or get to grips with there's not like a blog post you can read on its own or a book you can buy that that solves all that stuff for you so that's something you kind of have to have to dig through it's ultimately at, at duffel it's a problem that we've really wanted to try to solve because we we want to like take away barriers to people being able to build new and exciting travel businesses you know we need that innovation we need people coming into the industry and building new things and what we're really excited about is reducing the barriers and, and making it possible for people to do that so that if you've got an amazing idea for a travel business with a better customer experience or better service or something that no one has imagined before trying to make it so that all these things like accreditation the setup don't have to be a barrier to doing that so you can start building your idea and, and get something work, working really quickly so with the way that we've built duffel today it's it's actually 
possible to skip all of these painful steps and get everything you need to sell flights in just a few clicks. We call this duffel content, not a very original name, but it's the, it's the one that we've gone with. And with that kind of product, you get the accreditation, the airline relationships and more just ready to go in a box. And I think thanks to that product, we've already seen lots of amazing new travel businesses launch with duffel and we're excited to see many, many more, including hopefully from some of you who are, who are here with us today. Um, and one thing to note is if you kind of start on Duffel and use that Duffel content service, so you, you take all that stuff out of the box, the, the accreditations, the relationships, all that kind of stuff, you're not stuck there. We're not necessarily trying to say that you have to use that forever and you know you can't build your own relationships and get your own accreditations. The, the way that we've built our platform allows it you kind of to seamlessly transition between those worlds. So you can get started really quickly, build something, test it with customers, you know, start generating revenue. And then later when you want to, when you're ready, when there's value in it, you can start to do that kind of stuff yourself. And we have customers that are right at the beginning of that journey, customers who are kind of halfway and customers at the end. And indeed customers who, you know, even as they grow, decide to continue to use that service because they find it valuable and it takes away bits of, bits of selling travel that are hard. No, thanks for sharing. Those are our great insights. Um, we did have one question come in that's related, so I can hop into it now. It, do any of you have any tips on, on how to differentiate as a travel seller? We talk about being differentiated. Are there any tips or examples on secret that? Secret source. I see Sam raising his eyebrows, doesn't want to give away the family secrets. <laughs> Not at all. No, it's like a million dollar question, that isn't it? That, that, that's what every business wants to know the answer to. Um, maybe I'll hand over to Steve on that one. Yeah, happy to take it. Um, I mean, there's like a lot of examples I think I could pick from. One that's um, particularly um, close to heart at the moment or something that uh, I'm, I'm quite invested in is thinking about the post booking customer experience. Um, the, Obviously, uh, the, the last two years have kind of served as, a, as an example of what not to do in many, in many cases, although I'd say that the industry as a whole has reacted quite quickly, where, um, where things are, are not as good as they could be is on the, um, the automation side of things. So I think there's still too many things that you have to do uh, manually, where you have to uh, reach out to airlines call centers or maybe travel agents uh, call center and this could be uh, a lot more automated and self-serve and um, that's like one I think very big avenue for differentiation today and we're seeing merchants thriving um, by doing customer success uh, customer support much better than uh, what's typical in the industry uh, so that's definitely a one uh, I would be one answer out of many others but um, maybe team and, and some of others. Yeah, I'll offer a what not to do answer. I think probably the worst thing you can try to do is think that price is the thing that you're going to compete on. It just ends up being a race to the bottom. We talk to lots of people that try to do that and it doesn't tend to work out terribly well for them. The market is incredibly competitive and margins can already be quite limited as it is unless you're very creative. So if you're saying, you know, my way of winning is going to be being the cheapest, not only is it probably going to be impossible, there's always going to be someone who's willing to undercut further. You know, you're probably not going to be building something very sustainable. So the key is to look for ways of differentiating, I think, outside of that. And I'm sure Sam can Sam can share maybe some of the ideas he hasn't prioritized, some of the ones that, you know, he's put on the back burner and, you know, decided not to take himself. I think you make a great point there, Tim. Yeah, I think the, the race at the bottom on price is, is very short-termist. Um, and it's, it's very hard to generate real customer loyalty in the sector by doing that. So I think that's a very good what not to do. Um, I'm, my advice here would probably be pick things you're good at and double down on that. Um, you know, we, we only do flights. We don't do car rental. We don't do hotels. We want to be the very best, the very best in the business at flights. And that's a big enough project. You know, every customer globally, wow, every market, every reason for, for booking a flight. Um, I can't even imagine the complexity of a business running it with lots of other products alongside it. So my advice, you know, whilst that's not pure differentiation, I would say that pick something you're good at and become the best at it rather than they're trying to be um, middle ground on everything. Great insights and actually leads into a little bit of our next topic around payments. 
uh, and how to make money on flights. So Tim, as you already mentioned, margins are razor thin. Uh, so it's hard to understand of how you can really make money on flights. Um, so Tim, if you don't mind jumping in further and sharing a little bit more about the process, because this area is also complicated, similar to those regulations and requirements like who's involved, what options are available, what are some of the things that you need to consider? Yeah, of course, happy to do that. Um, if we're talking about this kind of topic of payments, you know, there are, there are really two perspectives you have to think from. The first is, how am I going to pay airlines? Because unsurprisingly, they want to get paid when you sell a flight to a customer. And secondly, how are you going to get the money from the customers? Both of those things are much thornier than you might expect. Um, paying airlines could be a whole other webinar, and, and maybe it should be, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the customer payments part today. So how do you get the money from your customers to you so that ultimately, I guess, you can pay the airline and fulfill the, fulfill the service they want to book? As a shameless plug, though, the, the duffel content solution that, we, um, that I mentioned a bit earlier does solve the airline part for you, so something to, something to dig into a bit. So anyway, back to collecting payments from your customers. There are so many payment providers out there, and it's it's pretty difficult to know how to choose between them. When you're picking a provider as a, as a new travel business, I'd really say there are four things that you want to be thinking about. Choice, cash flow, cost, and control. So first off, choice. That's, that's really about the payment methods that you actually offer. For most people selling travel online, you'll probably be wanting to focus on the most popular payment method, which is card payment in, in most of the markets that I suspect people in this, in this webinar are from. But depending on where you are and where your customers are based, there, there might be other payment methods that are are relevant or potentially more relevant actually than, than card payment. Secondly, I'd say cost is something you need to be thinking about. So you, you need to watch out for how much it costs to collect payment from your customers and how much that's going to eat into your margins. Some providers can be much, much more expensive than others. You, depending on you know, the provider that you end up with, you could end up paying you know, five to 10% in the absolute worst cases. And that's a, a lot to lose if you're, you know, if you're on fairly relatively thin margins anyway. Thirdly, I'd say control is really important. You really want to make sure that you have the flexibility to, to run the business and build the business model in the way that you want to. So can you, for example, add your own markups in order to you know, make money or, or bundle in extras? Can you sell on mobile devices as well as on the web? You need to be thinking about these kind of things because you don't want your payment provider to be holding you back from the stuff that you really want to do to succeed as a business and to, and to differentiate. And finally, I'd say cash flow is a big thing to think about. You'll need to make sure that you can meet your payment terms with, with the airline or the other travel supplier that you're buying from. Much of the time, at least in the airline space, you're going to need to pay the airline up front. So you'll want to keep that processing time of payments you're collecting from your customers as short as possible to make sure that you can kind of bridge the gap between the two. And on top of those four things, you also need to make sure that the provider that you go to is willing to accept travel businesses. And the reality is that many aren't so keen on travel because it is seen as a kind of a high risk industry and not most payment providers are not necessarily well set up to deal with that risk or to help you to mitigate it as a seller. So we've got the kind of four things plus access there. We, we've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years talking to travel businesses, building their businesses from scratch on Duffel. And it, it turned out there wasn't really a great solution out there to those problems. So we, we built one, which, which we call Duffel Payments. Come back to that a bit in a, in a few minutes, but we'll let um, someone else chat for a bit. Thanks for sharing, Tim. I like, I like the four C's angle. Um, Sam, I know Alternative Airlines offers a ton of different currencies, I think over 150, um, and the ability to pay later. Can you share some of your thoughts just around payments and, and collection? Yeah, sure. First of all, I, Tim's just given a brilliant overview of many of the challenges and opportunities that we face on payment side in our business. And those kind of four C's that you mentioned, we, you're always evaluating those. You know, even I'd say a relatively established business like ours is always evaluating that. So I think that's a great overview of it. Um, quite simply, we see pop payment offering as a key differentiator. You know, we, we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very global customer base. So, you know, we have to offer local relevant payment options. Um, someone visiting the site from Nairobi um, has a very different payment preference to someone from San Francisco or Sydney. Um, so we do a lot of work with local payment partners to ensure regional payment options are available um, and make sure that that payment experience is, is as good as possibly can be. Um, as you mentioned, we do a lot of work in buy now, pay later solutions on the site. Uh, we want to give people flexibility in how they pay for a flight purchase. You know, typically in your own life, you'll probably pay for your car, your house, your furniture on credits. 
but travel is 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 probably one of the industries that hasn't embraced as much but it is changing uh, we are seeing a lot more demand from customers for that and a lot more travel sellers and airlines doing it um, so we offer, you know, longer term monthly financing options through partners such as PayPal credits um, and shorter term um, buy now, pay later in six weeks. Uh, we see great customer satisfaction on that where people can pay for like last minute unbudgeted travel using a uh, financing option. The other area that we're seeing great demand for the moment is cryptocurrencies. Um, they account for about one and a half percent of our revenue at the moment. We see that growing to 15 percent next year and 30 percent by 2025. Um, it's, we accept over 70 coins through our site. So uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of innovation going on. It comes back to the point I made at the beginning around fintech being a huge part of travel businesses, both facing the customer and internally. Um, I will conclude by saying I agree with what Tim said. Payments is super hard. Um, we dedicate a massive amount of time and effort in the business to improving that experience, understanding payment data um, and offer, offer, offering really personalized experiences. Um, I wish when we set this up seven years ago, there was someone like Duffel Payments around because we would have definitely, um, we would have definitely benefited from that because it, it is hugely challenging this area. And if we want to even switch a little bit from payments to also how to make money on flights, is there a way that alternative airlines looks today or is it grouping a lot of different things together? And that's kind of the model for how to make money on flights. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, as I, as I said, we're, we're a single product focus with flights, um, but one of the key kind of margin contributors is obviously ancillaries alongside that. Um, for us, we've got to make sure that balance is right. We want to get the right type of ancillaries for the customer, and we don't want to overload the booking experience with too much. Um, the whole point of our site is being able to book a flight super easy and conveniently wherever you are. So it's a real trade-off between the two. Um, but just to give you a bit of an idea on our site, we kind of break ancillaries down into two options. One is kind of enhancing the flight booking experience. So within those, we have uh, bags, seats, uh, priority boarding, automated check-in, things like Wi-Fi potentially in the future. Um, it, it's always great when I speak to the Duffel team because I know Steve and Tim very much prioritizing the seats and the bags works with NDC, which is incredibly important for us, not, not only from a margin contributing point of view, but really from a, a customer experience point of view. If you want to choose your seat and you can't choose your seat on a website, you will just abandon the purchase. So it's absolutely critical to make sure you have those ancillaries alongside. Um, and then the second type of ancillaries that we tend to, we tend to sell with our, with our booking process are ones that reduce the risk for customers. Um, we all know that buying a flight isn't a lovely purchase. It's quite a high risk purchase. So we, do, uh, we offer a number of products on the site that give customers flexibility over the, the flight purchase uh, and real reassurance in the event of circumstances. Um, and we see that gives customers confidence to book. So just to wrap up, probably two types of ancillaries, one that enhance the flight booking experience, which is critical customer experience, and second one that reduces risk for customers. Um, and that's how we kind of drive some margin alongside um, uh, the flight purchase. Very interesting, thank you for sharing. Uh, Steve, if we go over to you, what are some examples of the ways that you think about opportunities for making money on flights? I mean, at this point, I, I don't think I, I can offer much more than a summary because Sam has covered a wide array of, of the ways that you can make money on flights. But um, maybe one interesting insight uh, that I think is, is a common thread around what uh, Sam was saying on, on payments and um, then on ancillaries, and also kind of um, going back to what I was uh, saying earlier on the post-booking experience is that in everything we've said, um, it hasn't been as much about the, um, the kind of revenue opportunities than it's been about the customer experience. Uh, customer experience really is the driver. And I think that's one key takeaway from what we've said is that uh, if you, it can't be just about driving revenue. Um, revenue will come as a result of offering, offering some kind of differentiated experience from, uh, uh, for the customer, whether it's getting them um, local payment methods, uh, providing an excellent post-booking uh, um, servicing experience, or offering ancillaries, the right ancillaries at the time of booking. And I think that's really, uh, if there's one thing I would take away from 
from the chat we had about making money in flights, that would be that would be it. Great, thanks for sharing. One of the questions that did come up was if there is a preferred ancillary that you think will be most lucrative as a travel seller. Um, so is it seats, is it bags, is it something else that someone starting out should, should look at first? I mean, I, I can qu quickly take this one and then I'm curious to hear from Sam and Tim, but um, I, every time I think I've discovered what the most lucrative ancillary is, then I come across a new uh, travel seller that just sets a new high for, for uh, another one. So I'd say like they can all be pretty lucrative, but again, you have to think about how you sell them and, um, and make the experience really, really great for the customer. Sam, Tim, either of you want to jump in? Yeah, I think from, I think from the things that I'm excited about at the moment, the things that really speak to kind of passengers needs or concerns or worries post pandemic. So I've seen a lot of a lot of growth in terms of kind of flexibility type ancillaries. So like effectively buying insurance that allows you to cancel your trip at short notice, those kinds of things. Um, so I think like that's a that's a good example of like responding to clear customer needs and turning those into products in a way perhaps that sometimes airlines don't, you know, probably all of us here know that it's possible to book a flexible fare from an airline, but in many cases, you're going to be charged a lot of money to do that. You know, it's going to be it's going to be maybe disproportionately expensive or not fit for the particular passenger. So finding ways of providing that kind of security that people want in a in a cheaper kind of easier to pick up package, I think, is a really, really powerful one at the moment. And something that probably, you know, three or four years ago, someone would have said, like, oh, that just isn't interesting. Like, why would anyone want that? Whereas now it's, you know, the hottest thing. So I think that also speaks to what Steve said. You know, there are great ideas coming along all the time. And it's it's really exciting to see that innovation. Yeah, I think just to add my two cents to that as well, I think um, it's a really interesting question because what, what does lucrative mean, really, in, in the sense that, you know, Steve's right, the customer experience has to drive everything. Um, so I think I think when you're looking at what type of ancillary should be offering alongside your core product, you're looking at things that either really enhance that experience for customers or really reduce risk for customers. And I think if you get that right and you identify those pain points for customers, then it will have high attachment rates and ultimately be successful for the business. But the key thing is to really think about what, what is it that the customers find difficult when they're searching, booking, or even traveling. And if you can identify that, then it tends to be a successful product and have good attachment rates. Great, appreciate the insight there. Um, and so now we've finished off those three topics. So we've covered a little bit on why now is the best time to get started high level on regulations and requirements and looked at some of the common challenges around payments and making money. Uh, Steve, Sam, Tim, thank you so much for your insight. Um, but we're not done quite yet. We still have some time for some Q&A. So um, all the attendees, feel free, please feel free to submit your questions and we'll go through uh, a few of them now. Um, we do have some coming in. So a question for Tim regarding customer payment. Have you tackled installments or settlements in LATAM, if we trade there, uh, a building trend globally on, on B2C or B2B2C uh, and massively impacting cash flow? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, very aware that in some markets, particularly in Latin America, this is just an absolute must have. And I'm sure probably Sam, from his experience there will, will, tell, will tell you the same thing, you know, without, without those options and without... If you don't have the right payment options, the markets you want to sell in, you're just going to be uh, you're going to be dead in the water, really. Like you're you're not going to be able to sell there. And you know, instalments is a is a clear example in Latin America. And I think there are there's an argument for saying that the kind of use of instalments is going to become more and more important, even in you know the the Western like European and American markets that we many of us might be more familiar with. This stuff is becoming becoming more and more popular. It's not something honestly that we have gone into yet. We don't have a solution there, but it is something that we are are thinking about in kind of the fullness of time as we kind of grow the duffel payments product that we have. So thinking about how we can widen and deepen that proposition with, with more local payment methods and more flexibility for, for those kinds of things. Definitely something that we're very, very aware of. And we would, whoever asked that question, we'd love to talk to you more about it and hear, hear what you need. Great, thanks. Uh, another one of the questions is, can someone enter the business being located in the US instead of the UK? So I know we're representing more of the UK and the European region. So any insights or views 
on the US, how it's different, uh, how we may support what it looks like. Yeah, happy to take this one. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, so Duffel works pretty much um, globally. And if you are um, if you're a travel agent based in the in the US, uh, you can uh, access our product and and use it from there. We have uh, NARC license in the US, uh, relationships with airlines, so it's all ready to go. Great, thanks. Uh, another question. So, no one when we were on regulations and requirements, um, no one mentioned ATOL, and so ATOL is air travel organizers licensing. Um, how do you deal with ATOL and PTR licensing requirements? Is that something we can answer high level today, or something we can take away uh, and answer separately? I can take this one from our business. Ours is flight only business. So the ATOL requirements don't fall under that umbrella. So um, I am by far not the most uh, advanced or expert in this area. So I'm sure Tim has much more knowledge in this area, but yeah, quite simply as a, as a flight only retailer, um, we don't fall under the ATOL requirements. Yeah, this is an example, I think, of the challenges that come with, with going global as a travel seller. Depending on the markets you're operating in, not only are there kind of licenses and accreditation you might need, but there are also just market specific rules that you have to worry about. So this particular case is about how in, in kind of European Union countries plus the UK, there are rules that basically say if you sell a package, so if you join together multiple travel services, so for example, flights plus accommodation, then there's certain kind of cover that you must provide around that package to make sure that if you go out of business as a travel seller, the, the, the customer still gets to go where they where they book to go. So you're responsible as a travel seller for providing that kind of protection. Right now, that isn't something that we that we kind of take care of for our customers, but it is definitely something that we would like to go into and we, we see as an, an opportunity for the future. So if you were planning to use Duffel or indeed using, you know, any other kind of, you know, API or flights provider to sell flights plus other travel products like car hire, hotels, etc., then this is something you do need to pay attention to in, in many markets. Great, thank you. Uh, Sam, you mentioned seats on NDC. Is NDC the way to go for content or, or how do you look at NDC? Cool. How long have we got? That's a, that's a, <laughs> yeah. That's a great sure. great sure. question. Sure. Whoever asked that, really good question. Um, where do I start with that? Um, first point, seats are super, super important to the booking process. Said that already during it, but it is really important where you source your content from to sell airlines is really important as well. I think you need to choose a partner that it understands that the ancillaries associated with the flight content here are as important as the flight content. And I think your choice of technology provider in that area is really, really important because some prioritize it, a lot of others don't. They're very focused on providing the flight content. So, um, you know, we have worked with Duffel for three years. We, in terms of, do we see ancillaries and seats as critically important? Yes. Um, is there more uh, efforts from the airlines to be able to provide ancillaries on seats and bags pricing and availability through the NDC channels? Yes, there is. There's a lot more work to do. You know, Steve and Tim, I'm sure, will, will recognize that as well, but it is coming. Um, it's a big, big part of the, the booking process. So I would say, yes, you know, it's not there yet, but it will be in the future. But there are a lot of airlines that we are already doing seats through NDC, through Duffel on, and being very successful with it. So um, that, that, that's a prime example of how successful it is right now as well. Great. Um, another question, if uh, anyone has any tips, is while sell selling travel, how can one overcome the hurdle of fluctuating international exchange rates and not lose money? That's a, that is a multi-million dollar question, right? Yeah, very hard problem. <laughs> um, I guess that is something where actually already where, where Duffel is today has parts of a solution to that, although I wouldn't claim that we've solved the entire problem forever. Um, I mean, a, a really key part of, of solving that problem is just trying to reduce the number of currency conversions that happen in your business processes. So a, a really clear way in which you can do that is by trying to make sure that the customer, you, the currency you charge your customer in is the same currency you pay the airline in. That's not easy to do necessarily because depending on the country where your kind of, where your business is based in general, the currency of that country is the currency the airline will want to use to, to deal with you. So 
that's already creates some challenges there because it, it tends to mean that if you're selling in lots of countries, there's going to be lots of currency conversion going on. And as soon as that happens, you're going to have the, the risk of currency fluctuations. Duffel content, which is our, our product that basically allows you to kind of get access to accreditations and airline relationships and all that kind of stuff off the shelf when you, when you sign up for Duffel, solves that to some degree, or, or we solve it under the hood and take care of that risk by already coming kind of loaded with agencies set up in multiple countries. So that means that we can actually settle with the airlines in, in many different currencies, which then reduces the number of currency conversions that we ultimately have to do and, and takes away some of that risk. So that's that's an example. If you want to do that yourself, you can, you know, Steve's already talked about setting up an agency in one country, or well, you have to go and do that in lots of countries for lots of different currencies. Duffel has already done that for you. Thanks for hopping in on that one. Uh, Steve, Tim, or Steve or Sam, anything else you wanted to add? Um, so we probably have time for one more question. Um, uh, one that just came in, what is your take on crypto travel, like Travala? Um, yeah, it's a it, good, good questions, like really good questions. Um, again, this is this is a prime example of probably the travel industry being a little bit slow to embrace technology. Um, you know, cryptocurrencies aren't necessarily a particularly new technology. They've been around a while. Um, but what we're starting to see now is that maybe four or five years ago, a lot of cryptos was used for investing and speculate, speculation, whereas now people wanting to buy products with cryptocurrencies. Um, and I think there is there is growing demand for people to be able to use the, the assets they have in cryptocurrencies to to buy travel, to buy flights, to buy hotels. Um, the company that was mentioned there is, is a prime example of someone specializing in providing travel with a, with a focus on cryptocurrencies. We're looking at it from our perspective to be able to provide our customers with that ability to be able to pay for it. Um, the really super exciting thing around cryptocurrency purchase in our business is the AOV is almost 60% up on regular purchases. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of business class flights being purchased with it. It's a lot of long haul, um, a lot of trips to the Maldives, some Mauritius and places like that, as you can imagine. So it's, um, it's a great one from our business perspective. Um, again, it just comes back to this point around differentiation. And um, it's also a nice way to be able to attract a different type of customer and demographic as well. So, um, so that's what we're seeing in our business, cryptocurrencies. Great. Thanks for doing Go ahead. <laughs> uh, going back to uh, very, very briefly, going back to something Sam was saying earlier, I think this is a great example of doing one thing and doing it well. Uh, they're just focusing on a very specific thing, which is uh, cryptocurrency acceptance and then going after it full force. So definitely, um, um, I mean, I know it's still, uh, it's still quite early uh, in that space in general, but definitely um, a recipe for success uh, generally uh, when going in flights. Perfect. Well, that's all we have time for today. Unless Steve, Sam, Tim, you had any last words that you wanted to, to bring up or share. Uh, then with that, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you for submitting your questions. I know we didn't get all of them today. I'm happy to take them off and respond to you separately. Uh, if anything else comes up, feel free to contact us through social media, uh, or also you can email us directly at hello at duffel.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, we'll be sending a full recording of the webinar out soon. So keep an eye uh, and we hope to see you soon at the next Duffel webinar. Um, also, for more content related to these topics, we did come out with a content series. So although Tim mentioned you can't get all the information in one blog post, we've been trying to try uh, to distill the information a little bit. So uh, if you go to duffel.com slash start a travel business, you'll learn a little bit more about these topics there. But again, thank okay. you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for joining and hope you all have a lovely evening.